And speaking of faith, no man in the Old Testament demonstrated faith more fearlessly than Abraham. Throughout most of the story uh, of Abraham's life, his wife Sarah is barren and unable to bear children uh, despite uh, however many years they've been trying to do so and it's really a source of uh, some frustration for them. How is it possible for Abraham to be father of a great nation when after repeated effort and petition his wife Sarah remained barren? The miracle of the promise to Abraham is that so many years go by and Sarah never gives Abraham a child. Uh, she's well into her 90s before she's said to conceive this child. Uh, and it's this miracle alone, the inconceivability of how a woman in her 90s can give a child uh, to her husband is the promise, once again, that God acts in history, that God keeps his promises. Abraham was rewarded for his steadfast faith. He received his long-desired son, the heir to his promise. Abraham and Sarah instructed Isaac in the way of the Lord, as Isaac served as a tangible reminder of God's faithfulness. But God was not done with Abraham. He had a further request. Abraham, confused yet unflinchingly faithful, prepared to obey God. Satisfied by Abraham's faith, God intervened to provide a substitute. Abraham, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know you fear God, because you have not withheld your son from me. Your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. Skeptics denied the existence of Abraham's hometown, Ur uh, of the Chaldees, until excavations at the beginning of the 20th century uncovered a temple tower at the mouth of the Euphrates in Mesopotamia. The name Abraham appears in Mesopotamian records. Now, one of Abraham's most famous descendants is Joseph, the son of Jacob. The story of Joseph really kicks off when Jacob gives Joseph a special coat. Joseph's status as favored son created jealousy amongst his brothers. Given opportunity, they conspired against him. The brothers sold Joseph into slavery and led their father headlong into a heart-shattering lie. They told their father Joseph had died. Upon his arrival in Egypt, Joseph was sold into the service of Potiphar, a high-ranking Egyptian officer. Joseph prospered in the service of Potiphar until Potiphar's wife developed an appetite for Joseph. She wants to be intimate with him. And Joseph, of course, resists her overture. But she's so upset, she frames him. And this results in Joseph being thrown into jail. Jail was brutal, yet God was with Joseph during his time in bondage. A pivotal point takes place in the prison and also is related to his gift of being a dream interpreter. While he's in prison, he's there with the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. The pharaoh, troubled by recurring dreams, sought an interpreter. His cupbearer remembered Joseph and brought him before the pharaoh. The pharaoh provided Joseph the details of his dreams. Miraculously, Joseph interpreted the dreams as prophetic warnings of a coming cycle of famine. Relieved that he was able to prepare his kingdom in advance, Pharaoh rewarded Joseph by elevating him to second in command. Some critics have questioned the story of Joseph, arguing a foreigner could never achieve such high rank in the Egyptian court. But the evidence says otherwise. We do know of people of a foreign origin uh, adopting Egyptian ways and, and making it uh, right up to the top of the Egyptian administration. 
Joseph's story is all the more remarkable as he was a Hebrew living in an Egyptian world. Now in time there emerged a generation of Egyptians who were unfamiliar with Joseph's good works. In fact, the Pharaoh grew threatened by the ever-increasing presence of the foreign Hebrews. In a fit of frightful paranoia, the Pharaoh decreed that the midwives should drown the children of the Hebrew captives in the muddy waters of the River Nile. It is out of these bleak circumstances that we get the story of Moses, the visionary lawgiver. Amram and Jacobet, the, the parents of Moses, put him in this little ark, this little uh, boat made of rushes in the, in the Nile, and then uh, led his fate up to God. <laughs> God was certainly kind because it was the daughter of the Pharaoh who picks him out of the, the bulrushes. And uh, that's what Moses means, drawn from the water. And uh, then he became a prince in the house of the king. Moses was tutored and trained in Pharaoh's court, where he became learned in the esteemed knowledge of the Egyptians, mathematics, philosophy, medicine, and architecture. Although Moses had an aristocratic upbringing, he couldn't neglect his burden for fellow Hebrews, who were often abused and blamed for all manner of trouble. One day Moses witnessed an incident destined to alter his life. He deserved to die like a dog. These people filled with righteous indignation, Moses exacted revenge. Stunned, Moses buried the body and his crime beneath the hot desert sand. Moses is now a marked man, of course, after he had murdered this uh, taskmaster. And so he goes into the Sinai Peninsula. After spending 40 years in Sinai as a shepherd, Moses had an illuminating encounter with the divine. of the Hebrews from Egypt begins with a miraculous escape from Pharaoh's feverish pursuit. The sojourn from bondage into the promised land, though, is marked by murmuring and disregard for God. Moses is called upon again to deliver a corrective message to the unruly people. Well, the interesting thing about the Ten Commandments is they tap in uh, and, and coincide with what our human reason tells us as well. Ethicists suggest the Ten Commandments appeal to a universal code that regulates human behavior. The Ten Commandments, you know, actually govern both religious aspects of life. Uh, the first three of the commandments deal specifically with a particular religion. But the other seven really are fundamental principles that every society ascribes to. Thou shalt not kill, the prohibition on theft. The Ten Commandments stand as an ethical foundation for the establishment of future civic liberties. The Declaration of Independence talk about, talks about the self-evident truth that all men, all human beings are created equal and that we have inalienable rights, not from government, but bestowed on us by our Creator. Uh, and that really sets the foundation for what kind of government we have and what the purpose of government is. Coming up, who was the great hero Samson? And did he actually do the unbelievable things the Bible says he did? The world over, Moses is celebrated as a courageous visionary. In fact, according to the Bible, his encounter with God produced the moral principles on which most modern civilizations rest. Remember that Moses was born under the threat of death. Our next hero has more promising beginnings. His name is Samson. When Samson's born, his parents give him over to what's called a Nazarite vow. 
Um, the Nazarite vow includes many things, but one is that you never drink wine, you never drink fermented or any kind of alcohol. The other is that you never cut your hair. You know, there's nothing special or magical about the vows themselves. They're a sign of devotion to God. And uh, if Samson is supposed to be about the work of God, uh, then it would be important for him to show devotion in some particular way. In a time of brutal oppression under Philistine rule, Samson emerged as a leader of great physical strength. In the book of Judges, a judge is a military hero and a charismatic leader. Somebody who shows a particular ability to fight and to lose.